Okay. All right, gentlemen, let's move on to the reasons to own gold. Uh, Jeff, again, you have slides here that uh, are broken up into two parts, real reasons to own gold and unreal reasons to own gold. I'm going to start with the unreal reasons first, and I'd like, uh, I'd like Gary to comment on these as well. You listed six major attributes ascribed to gold. You said that gold is said to be and is, to some extent, number one, a currency hedge, inflation hedge. Portfolio diversifier, alternative asset, a safe haven, commodity, and savings. Um, okay, uh, let's let's just we don't want, let's focus on currency and inflation hedge first. So uh, it, it's it's well I guess understood or uh, circulated amongst the gold investment community that gold is in fact an inflation hedge. In fact, one of the uh, primary or most commonly cited uh, thesis uh, or theses for buying gold. Uh, right now is uh, to hedge against a rising inflationary environment. Uh, you're saying that it is to some extent an inflation hedge. So uh, why is it not fully an inflation hedge, Jeff? Well, if you look at, you can look at different time periods in history. Okay. And, you know, from 1968, when, Nick, uh, we, when, when LBJ floated the gold price in U.S. dollars uh, to now, the correlation between changes in inflation and changes in gold prices uh, is 9%. So it's not a really great tit for tat uh, move as an inflation hedge. Yes, having gold in your portfolio protects you broadly against inflation. Also, if you look back over the span of time, if you go back to 1700, 1717, when, when England fixed the price of gold to the pound sterling, and you say, well, you know, today's price is $1,851 an ounce as we're speaking. And what would that be? What would the price of gold, which was, you know, uh, we didn't have dollars back then, uh, but it was, you know, one pound, I guess, uh, for an ounce of gold. Uh, the price of gold would be like $5,000, $5,500. So gold has not Gold is not a golden constant. And the book, The Golden Constant, reaches that conclusion. And it says, we don't understand. Gold is good protecting you against hyperinflation, but it's not particularly good at, at protecting you from that gnawing one, two, three percent per annum inflation that How do you really define hyperinflation? What, what's hyperinflation for you? Jeff. Well, an economist, the economist, the economic defi definition of hyperinflation is 50% mm -hmm. uh, per month, right? Now, we've never seen that. Yeah. But if you go back to the seven, 70s, we saw inflation 5 to 14% for the better part of about nine years. Yes. And that is what most people think of as hyperinflation. It wasn't hyperinflation as mm -hmm. an economist would think. But it sure felt like hyperinflation for those of us who lived with it, you know, yes. and it was extremely deleterious. And you did see the gold price go from $68 an ounce to $850 an ounce during that period of time. I see. And this speaks to something that Gary said earlier, because he was talking about inflation and inflation expectations. If you look at the period of 1982, it's very interesting because we had a deep recession. We had an international debt crisis. And the Fed and other central banks opened the sluices and just poured money into the uh, global economy to get us out of that recession. And investors saw that and said, this has got to be hyperinflationary. And gold prices went from $280 an ounce to $500 an ounce in six months. And then by, early, by the first quarter of 1983, we were out of the recession, the debt crisis, the international debt crisis had, was solved, and the Fed started selling bonds to sop up all of that excess liquidity yeah. and to yeah. finance the Reagan deficits. And inflation came down from, I think it was probably still around 12% or 10% at that time. It came down to 2%, and it never really has risen back up until last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gary, I want to get your thoughts on inflation. To Jeff's point, uh, during certain periods of very, very high inflation, uh, gold has performed well. I'm just going to throw this at you, Gary. Uh, the counter argument for why gold is not necessarily um, either an inflation hedge or the best inflation hedge is that if you look at how assets in general tend to perform during periods of inflation, you've got other assets like uh, the broader stock markets 
or uh, or real estate that have in certain periods outperformed gold uh, during inflationary periods um, over the long term over the last 50 years or so, or, or so uh, you, you could note that the S&P 500 has greatly outperformed uh, gold so if you just take just the stock market um, and, and say well if you invest over the long term that could protect your wealth over a period of several decades why would I need something like gold is gold still necessary as an inflation hedge, how would you respond? Well, <clears throat> I think that the, the best way to look at gold, first of all, Jeff's 100% correct. When you do a correlation at any point in time, the correlation between inflation and gold is rather low. However, when you look at a large time span, and the example I use in, in different lectures is I talk about the buying power of a, a gold coin, the $20 gold piece back 100, 150 years ago, and looking at what a currency is worth now. And the example that I use is back in, let's say, 1910, 1920, you could either use a $20 gold piece or a $20 bill, and they were synonymous and equal in value. And what you could do with that, you could buy a night at the plaza. I believe it was 8 or $9 back then. You could buy a nice suit, which costs 8 to $10, and a steak dinner. And all of that with either a one ounce gold piece or a $20 bill. Now, fast forward to now, and a night in the plaza, I believe is around $800 a suit, eight to $1,000 a steak dinner, about $100. So about $1,700 to $1,800. Now, that currency, the $20 fiat currency, will not come even close to buying that amount of goods and services, but right. yet an ounce of gold, you can liquidate that at about 1800 and it will still cover those costs. I believe that gold is a excellent hedge against inflation, but it's not sensitive to short term moves. But over time, what we have seen is that it has the same buying power over a period of 100 years or 150 years. There's no currency that can make that statement. And in terms of the stock market, when you look at the gains, yes, it will outperform gold in certain points, but it's also outperforming them with dollars that are inflated. In other words, the, the value of that dollar is going down. Yes, you're, you're making more of them. I tend to like gold from a long-term standpoint because I believe that it will always have a significant buying power. And that buying power over time, it will fluctuate, but it will still relatively be strong. Uh, Gary, okay, so gold has caught up to the price of uh, several of these uh, goods that you've talked about, uh, Night of the Plaza, steaks, and, uh, and expensive suits. Uh, but look, I I've heard that argument before. But do you think gold has caught up with these things over time because of its inflation hedge properties or simply because, as Jeff noted, it might be just a commodity, and commodities over time tend to appreciate in value, as do most things in the CPI basket? In other words, gold is simply just rising Moving because up. it's 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 part of the basket of everything. You know, real estate has gone up, a car has gone up. You can trade a car for the, I don't know if you've done this. A car to suit ratio would be more or less the same over time, right? So that argument could be applied to a lot of things, not just gold. Correct? That is correct. But let's look at it with what you've just said. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. correct. Uh, a commodity to commodity is going to have intrinsic value. However. The main thing that you want to realize is that against the dollar, which has mm. devalued in terms of its buying power, gold has been able to maintain that level. Okay, perfect. Uh, Jeff, uh, you have here listed uh, gold as a safe haven, maybe a safe haven. Uh, that is a term that's been loosely used by a lot of people. First of all, how would, uh, uh, and I'll, Gary, I'll get your thoughts on this as well, but first, Jeff, how would you define what a safe haven is and do you think gold oh, yeah. fits your definition? You want to take it first, Gary? No, go ahead. I mean. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Safe haven assets is something that that's a term that's often misused in, or misunderstood in, in financial discussions. A safe haven asset is an asset like gold that has a low corollary to stocks and bonds and other assets. Uh, it's not that they are stable in their real price or their purchasing power or anything like that. It's not that they have magic uh, properties. It's that they are a good place 
for you to diversify your wealth, both in terms of the numerator and the denominator, so that you can have a diversified portfolio that gives you protection against the vagaries and volatilities of stocks and bonds. So, you know, that's what a safe haven asset is. It's not something that doesn't, that preserves its purchasing power. It's something that helps you overall preserve your purchasing power. Okay, Gary. I No, I agree with, with Jeff. I mean, the one thing that we have to realize is gold over time has always had intrinsic value. And, and what we're talking about is the relationship between gold and a given currency. As long as we're doing that, if the currency isn't backed by anything, gold is still going to have that intrinsic value. In terms of looking at it in terms of different commodities, when you look at automobiles, they'll depreciate. There's certain assets that will depreciate. Grains have a, uh, a shelf life, so to speak, but they will hold their value. Gold will hold its value. So there are certain assets that will depreciate over time and other assets that will maintain intrinsic value. And I think that gold and silver historically have been two dynamic assets that have done that year over year, decade over decade, almost century over century. Gary, you and I have often talked about uh, gold's performance vis-a-vis -vis stocks uh, on, a, on any given day. Uh, tell us, uh, Gary, do you think that gold should be used as a hedge against Equities. I, I use the word hedge, not diversifier, uh, as a diversifier implies low correlation, but a hedge implies negative correlation. Is that is that something that investors should have in the back of their minds when buying gold? I, I believe so. I believe that when uh, U.S. equities or the global equities markets is strong, then you don't have you have investors that have a finite amount of capital to invest in a diversified portfolio. They're going to liquidity theory states are going to put it where their money gets the greatest return. So when you have a risk on environment and people are actively buying stocks and stocks are going up, you don't have the same attraction to something more stable like gold. Oh, it's not going to move in the same direction. Yeah. When the stock market is under pressure, you find that people will move money out of equities and into two primary places, the dollar or treasuries and gold. And in that way, they are safe haven assets. They are an alternative to a market that is moving in, an, uh, in a corrective manner. Okay. Uh, Jeff, have you observed uh, strong negative correlations between gold and the stock markets uh, over either a medium or long-term perspective? There are times when there's a very high negative correlation. You know, as Gary said, when the stock market is particularly high and vulnerable, and depending on what the economic environment it is, you, mm -hmm. you can see times when they move, you know, a negative 30, 33% correlation, uh, stocks, price, changes in stock prices to changes in gold prices. But, you know, overall, the, ne the correlation is like negative four, negative 5% in the long run. And that, again, going back to what Gary was saying, that's your safe haven asset. This is an asset it doesn't necessarily rise only when the stock prices fall, and it doesn't necessarily fall when the stock prices rise. And in fact, you can have long periods of time, uh, like 1970 to 1990, where you have a positive correlation between stock market and, and gold prices, uh, because as the stock prices rise, people feel wealthy, and they say, I want to have a diversified portfolio. And if I want to have a certain percentage of my wealth in gold, and my wealth is increasing because the stock market's increasing, that means I need to buy more gold. So, you know, that's what a safe haven and a portfolio diversifier does, is it gives you something that's uncorrelated to the other assets in your wealth basket. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to throw a, a counter argument uh, against owning gold during uh, market sell-offs. Uh, this is not necessarily my view, but it is a view nonetheless. Uh, this year, you'll observe that uh, the stock markets, uh, as well as other risk assets like cryptos, have done very poorly. Uh, select stocks in the tech sector have declined as much as 90%. Uh, indices overall have uh, had some of the worst year in, uh, in decades. So uh, 
you would expect gold to rise significantly during this period, but rather uh, it's done uh, not badly compared to stocks, but it's been flat. If you just look at the gold price performance year to date, it's been up a little bit, but more or less flat year to date. I'm not talking about the spikes in between, but just year to date perspective, it's been flat. People would argue, well, it costs money to store gold. If you buy a gold ETF, there's a management fee involved. In this environment where stocks are selling off because gold's flat, gold is basically a negative carry instrument. Uh, why wouldn't I just hold cash? At least I could earn some interest in cash. Maybe not very high, but it wouldn't be a negative carry. Uh, how would you respond? Well, if the first of all, if I may say something to add to the argument that there is a negative correlation between gold and stocks. It is true on many occasions. However, okay. there is an exception to that rule. If you look back into 2008, when they were flooding uh, liquidity into the markets to save off the recession, you had and had quantitative easing happening. You had both U.S. equities and gold moving up. That's when it moved up to its record high about the middle of uh, 2011. Stocks had been moving up in tandem with it and stocks kept going higher and gold began to fall. When it fell, it was a multi-year correction till about the end of 2015. When quantitative easing began again during this particular round, we saw the same thing. We saw U.S. equities and gold move higher in tandem. So what is that telling us? To me, what that expresses is that the dollar is being devalued. They would rather have equity in a company or physical holding of gold than dollars in a bank account because that those dollars in that bank account had less buying power month in, month out. And those are the exceptions, but we've seen it be an exception that has consistency. In other words, when the Federal Reserve is pumping money into the system through quantitative easing, through uh, additional purchases and, and a swelling of their um, balance sheet, and you have the administration pumping out trillions of dollars in aid, those effectively devalue the dollar and people okay. flock to US equities because those companies are borrowing money at nothing and they're going higher and gold. So they're running in tandem in that instance. All right. Well, Jeff, how would you respond to the uh, criticism that gold has basically uh, been worse than cash this year, if I may use those words? I, I suspect that someone thinks that, you know, I set you up to ask me that question. Um, <laughs> we have a, a, what we call a quilt chart. We look at 11 classes or asset classes of things, you know, large U.S. cap, small U.S. cap, cash, real estate, uh, non-U.S. large cap, you know, all kinds of financial assets and gold and silver. Now, we're only two thirds of the way through the second quarter. And the second quarter has been bad for gold and silver, and they'll probably be down. But if you just look at it in the first quarter, from the start of the first quarter to the end of the first quarter, silver was the best performing asset of 11 asset classes at 7.7% increase over the first quarter. Gold was the second best at 6.6%. .6. The next best was cash at 0.6%. And then you go down the list to negative 7.5% return. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, yeah, you've got all these people who think that gold ought to be $10,000 an ounce because they don't know squat. But the reality is that gold prices and silver prices did exceedingly well in the first half of this year. Yes. It hasn't, they haven't continued in the second quarter, yes. but in the first quarter, they, were, they weren't the best performing assets. They were the best performing assets by a tenfold, tenfold, you know? Well, so, I mean, anybody who tells you that gold and silver haven't done their job in, in protecting the, their, the value of their portfolio, you know, um, I, you know this is, this is ed, ed, American education at its worst. It spiked just on that point, and because I'm going to bring this up, because uh, you said that one reason to own gold is for catastrophic insurance. Now, I'm just looking at the gold price uh, uh, chart, Jeff. You're right. It's done exceedingly well in the first half, but a lot of that rally happened in uh, the middle of February to March, early March, which <laughs> coincided with the war in Ukraine. So what I could argue gold... Gold uh, hedged not against equity volatility, because keep in mind, stocks have been sliding far before February, but it was a hedge against 
a, cat, a, a catastrophe, as you would note, a catastrophic insurance. Uh, would you agree with my assessment that maybe gold did not perform as an equity hedge, but rather a hedge against war, geopolitical turmoil, and so forth? If you look at the first quarter of this year, it was a yeah. very interesting progression. In January, at the start of the year, a lot of people were buying gold, and the gold price was very strong, and it was predicated on inflation concerns. Yes. As the first quarter turned into February, you started seeing people saying, you know, inflation is such a problem, the Fed is going to raise interest rates. And the Fed was signaling, yeah, we're going to raise interest rates, and we're not going to do it like 25 basis points at a time. We're coming in there like, you know, like uh, Chicago mobsters or, or government officials. Uh, you know, we're going to do 50 basis points. And then you had gold prices sort of stall out because of interest rate concerns. And then Mr. Putin said, hey, you know, I, I've got a lot of my money in gold. I got to invade Ukraine. And so you had this third component. But over the course of that quarter, you had inflation, then interest rate concerns, and then the Ukraine invasion. Yes. And, and those three factors really drove it. And yes, obviously, when you know, Russia decides to, to go German on, on its neighbor, uh, that, that's a catastrophic e e development that yes. upsets the last 70, 80 years of, of international uh, relations. Uh, Gary, uh, I'm asking you to put on your speculative hat here and uh, just look forward as, as to what kind of catastrophe uh, quote unquote, could possibly move the gold price uh, again. I'm not. I'm not asking you to, you know, come well, up I, with black swan events, but just something within the realm of possibility. Yeah. Well, I, I think that what I'm going to talk about is not within the realm of possibilities. It is happening as we speak, okay. and that is the supply chain issue that we've had. First, it was bottlenecks from. Uh, pent up demand as we got out of the recession, people started moving around the country. Inflation right now is really predicated on extremely high oil prices. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Russia supplies, what, 30 percent of the oil to the to the global population and food costs. Now, when you look at Ukraine and Russia combined, I believe that Russia is the third largest producer of wheat. Ukraine is the fifth largest producer of corn, and none of that is going to the countries that they were typically exporting it to. These are staple needs from people that you are not going to squash the demand to eat. You're not going to diminish the demand for trucks to carry goods and services across the country or in Europe throughout, and that, that will require gasoline, it will require oil. As long as oil stays at the levels that it has been, which is above $100 a barrel, mm -hmm. that is the type of inflation that will create uh, not only uh, not so much demand for gold, but it will place a lot of hardship. And then by raising interest rates, it's not going to diminish the causality of the levels of inflation that we have now. They're, they're kind of pegged apart. In other words, inflation is running hot for a lot of reasons that the Federal Reserve cannot control. The spending of the administration continues to spend more dollars. And as long as we have high inflation that's due to food costs and energy costs and to a large degree housing costs here in the United States, that is an issue that's going to keep inflation high, regardless of how high they raise interest rates. And that's yeah. the quagmire, I believe, that we're facing now. All right. Let's talk about inflation briefly, and then we'll close on your gold price outlook. Uh, Gary, let's continue with your thoughts. Uh, you were just talking about uh, uh, other factors that uh, the Fed cannot control. Now, these exogenous factors, such as the oil price, such as food price, as a result of uh, supply chain and logistical problems. Uh, now, there's one school of thought, which is that these prices will stabilize on their own with or without the Fed's help, meaning that even the Fed does not raise interest rates, a big component of headline inflation housing, oil, food, these will just sort themselves out through the natural, natural laws of supply and demand. In other words, inflation is transitory. Do you agree with that? Well, how are we defining transitory? I agree fully that the supply chain issues, the price of oil, the food costs, they will unravel over time and kind of work themselves out. 
The question is how long it, will that take? As far as the conflict in Ukraine, until that comes to a conclusion, we're going to have issues with high energy costs and to a large degree with high grain costs. Yes. Also with the agricultural products, you have droughts in the United States. So we have additional supply chain issues for food. You're correct. Over time, they're going to work themselves out with or without Fed's uh, interest rates hike because they are not related and they will work themselves out on their own. But are they transitory? Well, I think they're a lot more persistent than the Fed assumed that they were. My sense is that inflationary pressures will run high at least through the end of the year, maybe first quarter of next. But the key is, is that it needs to be a natural occurrence. In other words, the conflict in Ukraine has to be resolved before we see any kind of real change or downsizing of the cost of oil and the cost of energy. And that's not going to change until that conflict is over. How long will that take? I don't know. I don't know that anyone knows the answer to that. But what we do know, as long as there is a conflict, it will continue to cause bottlenecks in terms of energy costs and in terms of agricultural costs. Okay. Jeff, same question to you. How transitory is this inflation? I ask this because if you just look at the history of inflation in the U.S. Uh, going back to the early 1900s, yes, there have been periods of high inflation in the double digits, the 1980s and before that, uh, you know, the 1920s, for example, but they haven't persisted for more than a few years. Uh, at no point in American history have we had double-digit inflation or very high single-digit inflation for for a very, very long time, close to an entire business cycle. So is this time different, do you think? Can we have 8% CPI for five years, six years? Or do you think this will just be the same as prior cases in history when things eventually come back down? Well, there are several factors there, but I, I think it's, it's more transitory. I don't think we see you know years and years and years of 8%. Yeah. And part of that is simple math. You know, we had very low price levels in 2020 because of the lockdown. And then we had very high price levels in 2021 because of the economic recovery and expansion and the supply problems and the fiscal spending and everything else. And, you know, um, I agree with everything that Gary said, except that I think that he's being ameliorative. I think that, you know, the supply chain issues the food and the energy issues, those things are even bigger and more persistent, and they're going to be problematic. Mm -hmm. And I think that issues related to how Russia interacts with the rest of the world, how China interacts with the rest of the world, those things are going to be problematic for years to come, and that's going to have some inflationary consequences. Okay. But if you just look at 2022 versus 2021, we don't expect price levels to come down, but the rate of change in price levels will decline. And you already saw a little bit of that in April. And you know the, the, big, the big increases in prices last year, in price changes last year, were in the second quarter and the fourth quarter. Uh, and so we're into the second quarter now. We will see May price uh, CPI data in the middle of June. And it probably will show some, some slowing. Uh, in addition to that, you're actually starting to see some, you know, in the first quarter, we had very weak GDP primarily because of low inventory building, primarily because of supply chain disruptions. And in the second quarter, you're starting to see major retailers say, we now have too much inventory of some goods and services, not baby formula, not semiconductors, but other things too. So you could see some downward pressure on uh, price increases mm. going forward. But I, yeah, I don't think that we see 8% inflation on an ongoing basis. I think that this is somewhat transitory. When we started using the word transitory in the first half of 2021, we made it very clear to people that what we were meaning was that by the second half of 2022, you could see lower percentage changes in price increase. People didn't listen to that. Yeah. But that's their yeah. problem, not mine. Just out of curiosity, uh, I'll start with you, Gary. Do you see any components of the CPI that may be deflationary going forward? I don't mean just a, just a slowdown in, in inflation, which, which still implies that prices are going up, but I'm talking about a decrease in prices. What could, 
fun fact, chicken wings have gone down in price because people are buying other no. substitutes. But, you know, things like that. Well, uh, what Jeff says is an excellent point. I mean, first, we have to define transitory. And, and to me, I believe that there's certain issues that will be persistent. And Jeff brought them up. And that's uh, energy costs based on what Russia and China are doing and agricultural costs. But in terms of the supply chain, in terms of the pent up demand that was unfulfillable, those are beginning to fill. And we're going to see that with a stronger GDP, unquestionably. It's what effect higher oil will have and how long will that remain elevated above $100 per barrel? Because to me, that is a huge indicator of all kinds of products and services that are somehow involved in terms of their price components uh, by what is the cost of transportation, what is the cost to produce it. And so that's the unknown to me. I, as I said, I believe that it will work itself through the system. The timeline, I'm hoping it happens by the end of this year, but it could be persistent into the first quarter, but it won't remain that way forever. Anything, and before I move on to Jeff, anything you think could fall in price? You know, that's a good question. I look back at costs as a, because I'm 67 and I remember the 70s and 80s when things really skyrocketed in terms of double digit inflation and they never really came down all that much, yeah. even though yeah. interest rates came down. Technology so, did. I mean, the cost of a TV, yes, computer. Yes, technology yeah. did, but not durable goods, not, right. not goods, you know, they did not. Technology will always come down. You get, you can get twice as much mm -hmm. for half the price a year later. That's a, a part of uh, technology itself. But I'm talking about integral goods and services that are not technology based. You typically don't see a price reduction at any quick pace after inflationary pressures drop. Jeff, what do you think? I basically agree with Gary. I mean, you know, you have some systemic issues in the United States economy and in the global economy that are going to prohibit price levels from declining and will probably continue to cause supply disruptions on the supply side. So I think that that's an issue. And, you know, one of the things that Gary was talking about how, you know, raising interest rates can quell demand, but it doesn't necessarily quell supply. It actually compounds the supply disruptions because all of a sudden it costs businesses even more to supply the things that other businesses and consumers want. So rising, raising interest rates can be actually inflationary on the supply side of the economy while being deflationary or disinflationary rather on the, on the demand side. All right. Well, final question for the both of you, and I'll start with Gary. Gold price outlook for the year, given your macroeconomic outlook, recession, economic expansion, whatever your case may be, how does your economic outlook tie into your gold price projection? When, well, when I look at different target areas, I go back to my technicals. And the critical area that we're facing right now in gold is the 200-day moving average. We are above it today, but we were below it before. And of course, I don't know whether you say it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but the majority of technical market uh, analysts look at the 200-day being a price being above or below it as a signal of a long-term bullish expansion in price or a bearish move. And so to have pricing below the 200-day moving average technically tells us that we could see more downside. I think that 1800 is a base point where we, is a critical level to hold, but the 200 day moving average at about 1836, it was at 1850 today, that needs to hold. On the upside, I'm looking at the 50 day moving average. And so we need to see gold move back above 1900 before I think it, it can actually pick up the momentum and trade to a new price high. Right now, I think over the next, say, quarter to two quarters, we are going to see it continue to be in a tight trading range, and that range will be $1,800 to $1,900 per ounce. Mm. 
All right, Jeff, uh, I know you've spoken to me about a recession that you think is going to happen uh, within the next two years, possibly. Uh, can you recap that thesis for us and uh, tie that into your gold price outlook? Well, I think, you know, the probability of a recession in the next four years is probably close to 100%. Okay. The question is, you know, does it, is it going on now the way some of the gold bugs say, or is it going to happen next year the way some of the major banks say? or is it gonna happen a little bit later? And it's really anybody's guess. Uh, there are some parts of the economy that have some slackness in it. So I think that we could go on a little bit longer, but there are these incredible uncertainties, the Ukraine war for one thing, uh, the food issues, oil prices, uh, the upcoming US midterm elections, issues within the European Union about unity and changing the structure of the uh, EU. There are a lot of uncertainties that could upset the, 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 the cart. You know, what our view has been is that gold prices, you know, we might, yeah, they're vulnerable to the downside. We're moving into seasonality. Uh, the war premium is dissipating somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, interest rates are rising. You, uh, you'll probably see percentage changes in, in CPI coming down over the next few uh, months. So I think there are a number of factors that could cause the gold price to be weak over the next four months or so. Our, our view has been that we could see it dip down to 1780, 1800. It's like, you know, plus or minus, it's within the margin of error. Um, and then, you know, our view was 1880 on the upside. So we got the same $100 range. It's just $20 lower than, than Gary's. Uh, and, you know, we're kind of looking at gold prices in that range for the remainder of this year, and then possibly starting to move higher again in 2023, depending on what the state of the world is. All right. Uh, well, excellent thoughts. That uh, ran a little bit longer than the 30 minutes I said in the beginning of the uh, interview, but hey, you guys uh, did really, really well and uh, gave us a lot of good information, so I didn't want to cut you off. Thank you both, Gary and Jeff, for coming on and doing this panel with us. Uh, great to have knowledge from both of you at the same time. Thank you again. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, that was it's Gary Wagner, editor of the goldforecast.com and Jeff Christian, managing director of the CPM Group. And we'll be back with Kitco News. I'm David Linton. Stay tuned for more. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.